I'm here this evening as spokesperson for the Southern Colorado Environmental Council. The reason why I'd ask Commander McLaughlin to introduce his staff Members of the Environmental Council, we know some of them, but we know the average citizen does not know who works actually at Pinion Canyon or who makes decisions about environmental issues and cultural issues at the maneuver site. And before the evening's over, I wish they could stand up, introduce themselves, like Hal, who is from DPW in Fort Carson, but who is the primary overseer of environmental works. And I think people need to be able to put a face on your personnel. Okay, a problem that we're having with the CEA, first of all, we would like to request from Fort Carson the drafts of the new integrated land management resource document that you're working on that will take effect in 2012. The current management plans they're working on will expire at the end of 2011. It is hard to assess environmental adverse impact conditions at Pinion Canyon with increased training without looking at their management plans on the land resource also on the natural resources because only then if we can see the drafts and critique them will we know if necessary protective measures are in there <coughs> to secure the site that not major soil erosion will happen. Another very important item of concern and in none of the documents, none of the three EISs that this EA deals with, the original 1980 EIS, the 2007 EIS, and your 2009 Rosie <coughs> Army does not address monitoring the groundwater under Pinion Canyon. This is a very big issue. That aquifer furnishes not just water for wildlife and domestic li livestock. <coughs> it is the drinking water of southeastern Colorado, parts of northern New Mexico, and western Kansas. When you went to live fire with an EA in 2004, <coughs> okay, one thing that was mentioned in there was not only the concern of lead, but the concern of the buildup of nitrate from green ammunition. This green ammunition, as it goes into the soil and it eventually leaches in to the aquifer, will make the water toxic. So at no point in any of these is there a timetable where with, when you increase training to start monitoring the water to make sure so you catch it and you can do preventive as opposed to correct it. Because once it's contaminated, our ranchers, our farmers, our small towns like Swink and Rocky Ford, La Hanna, okay, take it all the way to Springfield. They're not going to be able to drink their water. And that is one of the key issues why we've been after you to get those water wells up. You started with 95 working water wells, and they were located all over. Okay, from those, it's quite easy to monitor your water. Today, we are sitting with nine working water wells. That also there, we struggle with because part of the original EIS and through every EIS, including the CAD EIS, those water wells are seen as a source of water for the wildlife. So for quite a few years, we started dialoguing with Fort Carson clear back in the beginning of 2009. We are now in 2011, nine working wells, 
and last promise we got by midsummer or end of summer might get eight more up. The idea would be to at least get it back to 50 wells situated throughout the maneuver site where they're needed. We can't figure why it took you so long. You know, if it's a necessity, necessity for maintaining an ecosystem, that should be a present day priority. You can make all these future plans like in your 209, 2009 one, you know, you want to construct and develop a heritage resource center. You want to construct a central vehicle. That was two years ago, you know, washing facility. But well, we can't even get your personnel to simply get a decent number of the water wells working again, which is life-sustaining to that wildlife. We know it's a unique facility down there. We know the land is special. And what we kind of figured out is what is evolving in all these EAs. If you have, you know the scales of justice or like where you weigh gold, like you put the weights on to balance. At one time at Pinion Canyon, training was here and environmental concerns was here and keeping them up. What is happening is, guess what? The training is overpowering the environmental compliance aspect of Pinion Canyon. No longer are you taking the time to really address the environmental concerns down on that site. Warhorse Rampage Maneuver was a perfect example taking tanks off of, the, off of the roads and allowing them to make two feet, three feet deep ruts. Yeah, you can cover them up. Yeah, it may take five, ten years if possible, as you were, it was earlier explained to you for grass to come back up. But why do mitigation when you can do prevention from day one? We'd like to see those water wells back up. Not Again this year because we are always in drought and there's not they don't have access to the water and we do want to see some type of monitoring on the ground water. <coughs> Another thing that's interesting on all the CEA, you never specify specific <coughs> amount of maneuvers. How can we how can you how can we honestly say there will not be any adverse environmental impact from maneuvers. One maneuver, yeah, maybe not too much, but eight maneuvers in a year or six, yeah, you're talking a different ballpark. We need the Army to be start being honest about specific numbers, and you can give them, because logistically the Army knows exactly how many maneuvers you're going to do, because you've got to plan supplies, you got a plan to have the necessary finances available to put on the maneuver. So it's not like we're asking you to pull figure out of the thing. You already know how many maneuvers you're going to be doing in 2011, in 2012, 13, whatever. Or at least pretty close. You may be one off, but basically you know. If you don't, then it's a little poor plan. <laughs> and I don't know how you're doing it. There, there's a lot of issues, and the local community is willing to work with you on them, but do not take them as hostile attacks. <coughs> they are critiques, because we know you are there, and we know we have to live next to you, and there's no way in hell we're going to let you abuse that ecosystem and not answer for it, and there's no way in hell we're not going to reinforce and make you sustain it so you do not justify expansion unnecessarily. That's what we're asking. The other regs I forgot to mention that we wanted, but Dan Bedford, who is in charge of your rain control, you have also redone the 350.10 and 354 and that. We need to see those. Then we can give you an honest assessment of this EA. Without those, we're not, we can't say we don't know if there'll be significant impact. 
without those drafts, we know if you're going to continue to protect the land. If we see weaknesses, we want to point them out to you so that we don't end up with land that can't be used. The difference, <coughs> it's not a competition to see if you can be a good environment, environmentalist or steward. What you guys got to do is start owning that land, making it part of your heart. That's the difference between the local area and Fort Carson area. <laughs> We're part of Mother Earth. We were raised on her. We feel the joy when we ride down the road and you see that elk standing there. And we own it. And we worry about it, okay? We worry about that land out there. It's part of us. You can't remove, you can't separate. And you don't have to be a rancher out there to love the area. We were raised taking rides in that area because I lived in Trinidad. But on Sunday afternoon, the joy of our family was we took one of the county roads to see where we were going to end up. And you enjoyed it because you got to see the wildlife, you got to visit with ranchers you knew, and watch the production of the agricultural community firsthand. That's what it's all about. And you can enjoy that relationship with this if you just start allowing that land to become part of your heart. Because then maybe you'll be on the front line asking and demanding to continue to protect it. So that's what we need to do.